Last week we looked at the six days of creation without emphasizing the emphasis of that passage. And so that is what we're going to do today is look at Genesis chapter 1. Yes, our kids are dismissed. It's a good thing they get up and go because otherwise I'd never remember. <laughs> so Genesis chapter 1 and, and we're going to start at verse uh, 26 and, and look at the climax of that passage which which, you know, God does all of the six days of creation, but he does all of that for this day, for day six, um, for uh, the creation of man. And so that's our purpose today. And as we look at this passage, uh, you're going to see three different things in this text. Number one, the image of God in man. Secondly, the delegation of God to man. And then thirdly, the provision of God for man and for animals. So we're, we're going to be looking at that this morning. But let's begin by looking directly at the scripture. Then God said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, let us make man kind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for the privilege of being able to be people who have access to the Word of God on a daily basis. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to read the Word of God in our own language, to be able to understand it and take it in. And we just pray, O oh God, this morning that you would take this Word and bless it this morning. Fill us with it. Help us, Lord, to chew on it, to absorb it, to take it into our hearts and soul. In Jesus' name, amen. You probably have heard the phrase, Imago Dei, which is the Latin phrase um, for the image of God. And that phrase comes to us directly from this text, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Now in your homes you have images that remind you of certain people. But those images are not those people. Some of those people no longer live, but you still have images of them. They remind you of them. And you and I were created in such a way that we are to be images of God in the world, yet we never ever become God in the world. We only reflect Him and mirror him in the world. We are not among the cults who believe that you and I can become gods or should ever become a god. We simply are a mirror image, a reflection of God in the world in which we live. Now the Hebrew does some very interesting things with this text that is just about impossible to translate into English and for us to really grasp the meaning. And different translations try to do it in different ways, and they never really achieve it. 
For instance, the King James has one part of it that they nailed that the NIV didn't get, and yet the NIV got another part that the King James couldn't do. And, and so I want us to look at that King James verse of verse 27 says, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, singular. Male and female created he them, plural. The NIV says, God, so God created mankind, representing the human race, all of man, which is proper, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, and they use the plural there because they're trying to align it up with mankind. Um, but male and female, he created them. Now, in the Hebrew, it, it's a whole different thing, and, and, and these verses will be elaborated on in chapter 2, and we'll spend more time there. But for now, I want you to notice a couple of unique things that happen in the Hebrew in this text in verse 26 and 27. First of all, God created one solitary human being. And the Hebrew is Adam, from which we get the name Adam, but it's Adam. And, and that simply is the term for this one person that God created, representing both male, which the Hebrew word is ish. You women ought to just love that. <laughs> and for female, isha. And so from this one Adam comes the male and the Isha, the female. But when God created this first one, he did not call him Ish. He created him and called him Adam. He was distinctly different from Adam, distinctly different from Eve. He was one united person that incorporated all the aspects of what it means to be male and what it means to be female. And then as if to draw attention to it, God says that he created them in his image as male and female, even though at that point he still had just one person. And then you go down to Genesis chapter 2 where it gives the extended passage and it talks about all of this and where God differentiates them and took the woman, the feminine characteristics out of the Adam, leaving Adam without his whole nature and Eve. Both of these have the image of God stamped and written into them, both the man and the woman. And you and I should never, ever think that one sex or the other has the claim to the image of God. The image of God was written into Adam and and then he goes on to elaborate here and to say that in the image of God, he created Ish and Isha. Both sexes fully incorporate, both together bring out the image of God in our culture. Neither the man nor the woman by themselves fully express the image of God. That is something that we have to do together. We have to work together. A group of men all by themselves will never fully reflect the image of God. And a group of women all by themselves talking will never fully reflect the image of God. It takes both of them working together to fully reflect the image of God in whatever we do. Now what does it mean to be created in the image of God? 
First, it means that you and I are distinctly different from all of the rest of creation. All other creation, the solar system, the plants, even all the animals are spoken into existence by those simple words from God, let there be. And they're created. With everything else, your pet cat and your pet dog, God just spoke them into existence. Let them be. But when it comes to you, God didn't pause there to say, let there be people. Let there be Adam. He said, let us make. I want to get my hands involved in this. I want to make. And so God got involved himself, actively involved in the creation of humankind. Second of all, of all creation, we alone bear the image of God in the world in which we live. And that means that there should be nothing in all of the world that should be valued as high as the life of a human person. All of Mars and the solar system doesn't matter near as much as you do. You have more value than the sun and the moon and the stars and all the animals on all of God's wonderful creation. You, God has assigned a great, great value to. You can care about many, many wonderful things. But if you care nothing for the baby in the womb, or for the person facing end of life issues, or for the person facing injustice or suffering, then your priorities are completely out of whack with the will of God and the heart of God. Because the thing that God values and has assigned value to more than anything else in all the world that he created is people, people. That has to be our chief and primary value in all that we do. Thirdly, to be in the image of God means that we are social beings. Now, I'm an introvert. Some of you have already figured that out. I'm unique. Most introverts marry extroverts. I married an even worse introvert. <laughs> but um, there are extroverts and there are introverts in the world. Some of us are more social than others. Some people are energized by being with people and other people need to go home, wrap up, and isolate themselves to recover from being with other people. <laughs> but even the most introverted person is still a social being. We come out of the womb incapable of caring for ourselves. Most people end their lives incapable of caring for themselves. And in between, none of us do it very well all by ourselves. <laughs> you know, one of the things that has changed in world culture and U.S. culture is that it used to be there were a lot of orphanages in the world. Wesleyans used to run an orphanage in Hepsa. And over the years, that's gradually become other kinds of things and ministries and all of that. But one of the things that we learn, one of the reasons there aren't orphanages anymore, is that one of the things that we have learned is that 
you can't raise children to be healthy adults if they've been raised in orphanages where quite often they don't get that personal family interaction that they so much need for healthy brain development. It's critically important especially in the first even six, six months of a, of, of a baby's life, that they are touched, that they are loved, that they are talked to, that they are sung to, that they are cooed to, and, and that they are just held. And so just being having the, put in, in a crib and having their diapers changed and being fed doesn't make healthy adults. And so we just discovered that even the foster system <laughs> is a far better system than an orphanage. That babies have to have that interaction and that love and that touch that comes with family. And what's that got to do with the image of God? Well, God said, let us make man in our image. God singular was saying, let us, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, work together in making man in our image, which is a social image. God relates in all aspects of the Trinity, and God wants us to relate to other people like God relates in working together in the Trinity. And so God splits this Adam into two individuals so that they might have community. Community, like God has in the Trinity. Because it was not good for Adam to be alone. It was better for Adam to be split into two people, Ish and Isha, and to communicate with each other than it was for both of them to be still left in one solitary being. Fourth, we are moral creatures and creations of God. We make moral choices of right and wrong. That sets us apart from all of the rest of creation. We have a will. I noted when Pastor Wayne installed me several weeks ago that in the words of instruction to me, he specifically said that I was instructed to preach both law and gospel. Now, it had been a lot of years since I'd been installed as a pastor, so it had been a while since I'd heard that phrase, and it caught my ear. And I talked to him a little bit about that. And I think it's so wonderful that that's part of our installation process. We never know that we really need the gospel if we've never heard law. If we've never known that there's anything sinful or wrong about me, how do I know I need Jesus? And so we preach both the law and the gospel and all of that. But yet our culture today wants to completely strip away all the law. It wants to completely strip away the Old Testament from our um, statues, the cross, take it out of here and, and take the Ten Commandments out of our school system and all of those kind of things. It wants to completely strip all of that away from us and our day-to-day -day culture. And once they arrive at that, then there's no absolutes. <laughs> there's nothing that tells you what is right and what is wrong. And so we turn into a place, a culture where only, only the fit can survive. The strongest and the meanest people can survive in that kind of a culture because there is no right or wrong. God created us to be like him, and God makes decisions of what is right and what is wrong, and he wants us to follow in that. And so we have to train ourselves. We have to train our consciences and our morals to, to line up with what God says is right and what God says is wrong instead of trying to tell God what is right and wrong. 
for our culture. <laughs> no, he gets to determine our culture and what we believe and what we think and how we live. So that is the first thing, and I've spent most of my time on that, and I promise you I'm not going to preach to 1230 um, like I tried to do last week. Um, <laughs> but, but that's the first part. The second thing is this, and that is the delegation of God to man. God placed his image, the image of God, in us, but he also gave us a responsibility that he has, and he delegated that to each one of us. God delegated part of his role in governing and caring for the world. Isn't that a remarkable thing? You stop and think about it. Here, here, is, here is the God of the universe who is absolutely powerful, absolutely perfect, and does everything perfectly well. Now, I don't know if there's any perfectionist people in the room, but when you are a perfectionist, you tend to want to just do everything yourself and not delegate much. And it's a real weakness of perfectionists. That's a bad thing. <laughs> and, and, and so if you're a perfectionist, you, you kind of have to train yourself to delegate. But here is, here is the, the perfect God of the universe all-powerful and all of that. And what does he do? He gets done creating you and I. And he says, now, I'm going to turn over some of my responsibility to you. Go take care of this. That's a good lesson for some of us. Isn't that amazing? The God of the universe has delegated some of the responsibility that he has and he's given it to you and he's given it to me and he says, now go take care of this. I created this. Would you go take care of it? And so while nothing should be of higher value and importance in our life than another human being, yes, we should care for the environment, and yes, we should care for animals, and yes, we should care for all those kind of things, but never to the point of which human beings become lower and less important than all of that. God delegated his responsibility of governing the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the livestock, and all the creatures that move along the ground, we are to hold dominion, to hold rule over them, to keep them in check, and to care for them as God would care for his creation. And that should never be taken lightly. In fact, it's repeated twice. Did you see that in verse 26? It's there. And in verse 28, it is there, almost word for word, where he tells us, now you go take care of my creation. There is another thing related to this whole delegation of responsibility, and that is when God made us in his image, God had already worked six days. And God was saying that you, he was going to put us to work also. Now, I want you to notice that work came before the fall of man in, in Genesis chapter 3. Work is not evil. Work is good. It was part of a very good world that God had created. But on day six, after he created us, he said, no, here's some work for you to do. And then he said, and this is very good. Work. It's a good thing. It is something that you and I need to value and treasure and all of that. Um, it came before sin. And the only thing that makes work less desirable is sin. <laughs> sin.
sin is what has created the problem there. Uh, there Adam and Eve, they loved work until Genesis chapter 3 came along and there were complications that came in. There were weeds for the farmer. There was childbirth. There was uh, all these things that, that came along in Genesis chapter 3 that made it more difficult. But work itself is very, very good. And we are to re be reminded of that. Another thing is that when God said, when God created us, and he said, this is very good, he had already given his first command to man. Govern, rule, hold dominion over my creation. That means that it is always a very good thing, that we are really fully human when you and I are able to submit ourselves to another authority, power, restraint, when we can submit ourselves to something else, if we, if we can't submit ourselves to someone else, we are not really fully human. We are not really what God created us to be. Adam and Eve on day six had already been given command by God, told what to do, and they responded. They were able to submit to the authority around them, and especially to that of God. And then I also want to go back to this matter of male and female, and I want you to notice that in Genesis chapter 1, that dominion, that rule over creation is not just given to Adam, not just given to Eve, but it is given to both of them. And that tells us a lot about God's original intention for male and female relationships before sin entered the world. They were to work together to be fruitful and to multiply. And if we do anything, anything in this world for God, we will always do it better when both male and female perspectives and contributions are highly valued and appreciated and listened to. We never serve God as well when it's just men and when it's just women. But when we work together, relate to each other. That is when we are most successful at being what God wanted us to be in, in reflecting his image in the world and making a difference. Secondly, that tells us that man is not put on earth to be ruled by women, nor are women put on earth to be ruled over by men, as though they were simply a little higher than the animals. <laughs> No, we are put here on earth to work together in the world that God has given us to reflect his image. And we do that very, very well together, not just individually. There is a pronoun in verse 28 that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but it is highly significant. Many things... In, in many languages are either masculine or feminine. If you've studied foreign languages, a lot of foreign languages, Spanish is one of them, um, everything has a sex to it. The sun is, and I don't remember which way it is, I think it's masculine and, and the moon is feminine, and, and, but whatever you're talking about, it's got a masculine or a feminine ending to it because it's one or the other. Almost everything in life in a lot of languages. And that is quite often the case in biblical languages also of Hebrew and Greek. And that is because ancient cultures, under, they, they let everything take on this nature of personhood, of being like people. 
That's how come in ancient cultures and religions people worshipped the sun and the moon and the stars and birds and trees and all kinds of things because they allowed creation to take on the aspects of being human. It's very interesting that Genesis will not have anything of that. Moses is very clear that everything else is simply in it. <laughs> And so, in ancient literature, you would have the Mr. Sun and the Mrs. Moon, but when Moses describes creation and the earth, uh, he doesn't describe it as male or female, he simply describes it as it. The created order is never ever to be superior to mankind. We are superior to everything else God created. We are a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor, the psalmist writes in eight, uh, Psalm 8 verse 4. Non-Christians worship things that are inferior to themselves and I am very sad to tell you that in many denominations in America today there is a lot of worship going on that is starting to worship all kinds of other things in creation and they are completely missing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ don't be one of them you do not worship things that are inferior to yourself. You worship the only thing that is superior to yourself, the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And never go in between and worship yourself or any other human. Christians worship God the Father in spirit and in truth and we will not have anything to do with the worship of any of the rest of creation. We simply worship God for the creation because he made it all for us. Now I will not finish if I don't keep going. <laughs> This last one is short, and that is the provision of God for man and animals. God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And then he starts talking about the beasts of the field and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. And he says, you know, for all of them, anything that's green out there, it's for you. God provided. And so at creation, God is providing for man's food with every seed-bearing plant and fruit-bearing tree. Um, the shedding of blood had not happened. There was no need for that. There was no sin. So there was no need for the shedding of blood to atone for sin. So there was no reason to ever uh, kill an animal at that point. And so there was no reason to eat meat at that point. But here in the very beginning of creation... God provided for us, said, here's, here's what I've given you. This whole world I've given you, these six days of creation, I did that all for you. And now I'm giving you food also. All of this is for you. And then for the animals, he gave them everything that was green. I want to say to you in conclusion this morning that the greatest thing you will ever, ever hear about yourself is in the word of God. Psychology and all this other stuff that is out in the world can never ever come close to telling you the good news about yourself like the Word of God can. The greatest thing you will ever hear about yourself has been spoken by God in creation. You, both male and female, have been created in the image of God. And there is no higher honor in all the world than to be told that you have been created in the image of God. 
and you have been created in the image of God to reflect and to represent his interests in the world and in creation. You have a God who has trusted you with great responsibility. And you have a God who has provided for your daily needs and he cares about that. And he cared about that way back on day six of creation and even before. And you have a God who ordered all of creation so that you might enjoy it and benefit from it. Worship him and him alone.